working memory is limited, and as we learn, it can become overloaded, which reduces the amount of information we can move to our long-term memory. But the way we present information as teachers can help reduce cognitive load and increase learning, helping children to retain new information. So how should we organise our teaching so that children will remember what we're teaching them? Well, let's go through the 10 main principles that teachers need to understand. When I first started teaching, many children in my class weren't secure with their times tables. So when I was introducing a new topic, such as how to multiply a two-digit number by a single-digit number, I'd give the children questions like 79 times 8, because I hoped that they would be able to both learn the new skill and, at the same time, become more secure with their times tables. But here, I was violating our first principle, the element interactivity principle, which emphasises that lessons need to be tailored according to children's existing knowledge and skill. When a task is already complex for the children, there is no room in their working memory to process any more information. If children are struggling to recall their times table facts, the cognitive load is too high, and they won't retain the new information taught in the lesson. Because there's a high cognitive load, there's no new learning. There's nothing transferred into long-term memory. So instead, it's more effective to reduce the cognitive load when you're teaching something unfamiliar, and keep the numbers simple, starting with questions like 23 times 2, so there's a lower cognitive load, and children can transfer knowledge of the method into their long-term memory. Then, once children are confident with the method, you can increase the difficulty. To start your lesson on, for example, multiplying a two-digit number by a single-digit number, giving the children a pile of base 10 blocks and asking them to work the method out for themselves isn't going to work. That's why our second principle is the worked example principle. Instead of expecting children to be able to discover things for themselves, the first part of your lesson needs to be teacher-led. You need to work the children through examples. So, start by teaching children the method, going through worked examples so that children understand how they can apply the skill. Then, once the children know what they're doing, you can use concrete resources so that children can reinforce their understanding. Our third principle is the segmenting principle. This relates to the worked example principle. Children will feel overwhelmed if all the new information is presented in one go. Showing too much at once makes it harder to process. So rather than showing the complete solution straight away, make sure your board slides are structured to reveal the new information gradually, one step at a time. Children learn more effectively when you break down a method into smaller segments, going through some examples one step at a time, and then gradually reducing the scaffolding as children develop their understanding. In the question I just went through, the explanation would probably still be unclear to most children because I ignored our fourth principle, the signalling principle. As you go through the steps, you need to highlight what step you're on so that it's clear for the children, or at least use a pointer like the red pointer I have here. This makes it clear to children where they should be directing their attention at any given time. To learn effectively, children need to be focused on the thing that you're explaining. If children are having to listen to an explanation while also searching for the relevant details on the board, they're likely to experience cognitive overload and so won't be able to commit what you've taught them to long-term memory. The fifth principle is the contiguity principle. This involves showing pictures at the same time as showing words or numbers. So here, rather than using examples which show what's happening with base 10 blocks, and then using examples with numbers, it's more effective to show both at the same time. 
So here, I've shown 3 multiplied by 2 next to where we write 6, and 20 multiplied by 2 next to where we write 40. There is a tension here with most models of mathematical learning, which often say that children should understand something pictorially before they learn to understand it abstractly. But cognitive load theory argues that as long as you're going through something one step at a time, it's more effective to use both the representations of numbers and the numbers themselves. This is linked to another principle called the split attention principle. If you show the pictorial representation and then show the numbers on a different slide, children will be trying to recall the representation while you're showing the numbers, and this will lead to cognitive overload and prevent learning. When I first started teaching, I used to include lots of animated graphics and sounds into my teaching materials. My theory was that this would make my board slides a bit more interesting, and so help children keep their eyes on the board and pay attention. Children would sometimes laugh or shout out, wow, that's so cool, and I'd mistake that for actual learning. But in fact, rather than aiding attention, unnecessary graphics and sounds just cause distraction and prevents children from learning. This brings us to our sixth principle, the coherence principle. Children need to be focused on the thing that you're explaining, so only use pictures if they support your explanation, and avoid fancy animations and sound effects. You want your class to be completely focused on the new learning, rather than considering which animation effect or funny picture is their favourite. So, delete any unnecessary graphics or sounds from your teaching materials. Similar to the coherence principle is our seventh principle, the redundancy principle. It's useful to include key words on your lesson slides, which you can point to and explain, but you should never show a full paragraph of text to support your explanation. When I first started teaching, I did this a lot, partly because I was concerned that I'd forget what to say, and so having everything copied into the PowerPoint seemed to make it easier. But the problem is that children don't know whether to look at the written explanation or the thing that's being explained. What's even worse is when you don't read out what's written word for word, but read out something slightly different. It adds to the confusion, so adds to the cognitive load. People learn best from graphics and narration, rather than graphics, narration and on-screen text. Of course, there might be times when during an English lesson you might want the children to analyse a whole paragraph of text, but unless it's absolutely necessary, you want to limit the amount of text shown on screen. Our next principle, the example problem pairs principle, is about asking children to solve a similar question alongside a worked example. So, explain how to solve a problem one step at a time. But after each step, check that children can apply the methods to a similar question. So here, I would explain and show how the question is written out in the column method, and then get children to see if they can write out this question as a column multiplication in their books or on their mini whiteboards. Then, I might explain and show that we start by multiplying the units digit, and then get the children to multiply the units digit for this question, then I'd do the same for multiplying the tens digit and adding up the totals. The point here is that children can practice one step at a time, so reducing their cognitive load, rather than having to memorise a whole sequence of steps before they can apply what they've learned. Once children are familiar with the content, they should be encouraged to visualise what they have learned. This is the imagination principle, and it's about helping children to understand and store the information in their long-term memories. So eventually, once you've gone through some examples, and once the children have understood the method, you want to take away the pictorial representations of what's really happening. But when you do that, you then need to get the children to visualise the representations. 
This is especially useful if you're teaching something more advanced than this example here, so perhaps something that involves exchanging or regrouping. At first, you might show a picture of what's happening on the board. Then you might give the children some base 10 blocks so that they can demonstrate their understanding. But once they've done that, give the children a different question and ask them to imagine what's happening with those base 10 blocks before getting them to explain it verbally to each other. This will help the children commit what they've learned to long-term memory. So far, I've emphasized how you should adapt your teaching according to the principles of cognitive load theory. But our final principle, the expertise reversal principle, is about knowing when to stop teaching. Fully guided instruction works well when the children are unfamiliar with the material but it becomes less effective or even counterproductive as children become more skilled. Once children are able to solve a problem independently, you need to give them the opportunity to do so. If you just keep on talking, children will either lose their attention completely or else be constantly cross-checking your explanation against what they already know, which unnecessarily adds to their cognitive load. So start by omitting some of the steps from a worked example and then move on to giving children something to complete independently. This principle relates to a finding in the wider field of the psychology of learning called the testing effect. Once children are able to do something, it's more effective to give them a test or an opportunity to practice than it is to re-explain the material to them. So you need to be constantly assessing have the children got it? If they have, then take away the scaffolding and set them off. So at keystage2maths.com, each video applies these principles of learning. So the element interactivity principle is met by making sure that each lesson builds on what's taught in previous lessons and introduces new ideas using numbers that don't require rapid or secure mental arithmetic skills. Worked examples are used, and with each example, the learning is broken down into smaller steps or segments. Each of these steps is highlighted, so children are clear about what they need to be focused on. And for each step, where possible, pictorial representations are used alongside numbers. There are no distracting animations or sound effects, and text is rarely shown on screen. Instead, verbal explanations complement the worked examples. The final three principles are harder to apply in the video format, but are easy to embed in your routine classroom practice. To recap, we have example problem pairs, where you show a step, then the children do a step. Imagination, where children have learned the material but are encouraged to form a picture in their minds of what's happening, and expertise reversal, where once the children have got it, you let them get on with it. Cognitive load theory is a really big topic, and so naturally there's a lot that has been left out of this video. But I'd encourage all teachers, and especially new teachers, to take the time to become more aware of educational research not least because if you know what doesn't work, it will save you time in the long run. As an NQT, I remember spending hours creating teaching resources for just a single lesson, but that's only because I included unnecessary detail, irrelevant pictures, distracting animations, loads of things which took me ages, but in the end didn't help the children learn. Once you're aware of the research, you can make sure that all of your time is spent doing the things which help children learn, and none of it is inadvertently spent doing something which makes the learning more difficult.